Welcome everybody to another episode of Be Brown Bag. Tonight we have John Studerus at John underscore Studerus, who is going to present three armed OpenStack. As always, you can follow our Twitter hashtags, uh, Twitter handles. But if you want to send out a question through Twitter, you can use the hashtag uh, Be Brown Bag. And I remind you that we have several shows. Uh, Brazil has been super popular. And U.S. is normally the strong one, but we also have shows in EMEA and Latin America. Again, uh, John Studeros is with us today. I'll let him introduce us. And this is Ariel Sanchez. You can also tweet at me directly or just send me uh, questions through the interface. I am going to switch presenter now to John, and I will get out of his way so he can present. Fabulous. Okay. You, you might want to turn your, your cell phone on mute there. Yeah, I know. As soon as I... Yeah, okay. It, it always happens to me. Like, the last week, I was... As soon as I started recording, I got someone pinging me on Slack. So. Um, okay, so I am live on the slideshow. Can everyone see the slides okay? Yes, you're, you're good. Okay, no, okay. Great. Uh, so tonight, we're going to be talking about um, a project we put together... Uh, and when I say we, I, I mean myself, um, around uh, ARM processor and its use in building out OpenStack clouds. So um, I, a uh, couple of different ways to get a hold of me. So of course, uh, Twitter, so at John Studeris. Um I'm a president of, of a cloud uh, security consulting company, JHL Consulting. So I'm John at JHL Consulting. And then I'm also an OpenStack ambassador in the US and run a bunch of uh, meetup groups across the U.S. So if you're just in that capacity, my email address for that role, it's uh, john at openstacksandiego.org. So real quick, what are we going to talk about tonight? Uh, we're going to talk about this project, this uh, OpenStack on ARM, and really what ARM is all about, what the processor is all about. We're going to talk about the uh, tools we use to build the cloud environments, uh, notably Terraform. We're going to get uh, in-depth on the Terraform configuration. Uh, we're going to talk about the installation options and some of the fixes that we had to do to the installer to get it to work on ARM. Uh, we're going to talk about the different hardware configurations of uh, processors and uh, server configurations we used in the different cloud configurations we built out. Uh, the type of testing we did, the methodology we used to test the various uh, cloud configurations, uh. and um, the results of uh, those tests. Okay, so real quick about me. Um, like I said, uh, JHL Consulting is my company. I do technical risk management, help companies look at uh, uh, cloud environments, identify risk, and identify potential uh, security problems and operational problems. Uh, and then I also do special projects like this uh, uh, on different types of cloud environments. Um, I've got a couple of uh, GitHub projects, if you're interested. This entire project, uh, in much more depth than I'm going to be able to go over tonight, is available on GitHub. So github.com slash works on ARM, uh, OpenStack works on ARM. And the works on ARM uh, project within GitHub is um, all the different uh, platforms and software projects that work on ARM. We're building out a whole set of them, and the OpenStack works on ARM is the first one. Uh, and then a couple of other ones that are OpenStack related. Uh, the second one, security service chains, is all about how to implement security chains within layer two of a software-defined network. Uh, the Magnum container is how to run a Magnum on top of bare metal, Magnum being the OpenStack container management. And then we've got another one, uh, Cloud Storage Workshop, uh, that actually I did in conjunction with Kyle from V Brown Bag. Uh, it's an OpenStack presentation on the basics of cloud storage that you can run through yourself if you're a beginner and you're interested in learning more about cloud storage. And all of them, they're all basically designed so you can go clone the repo run it all and get yourself a running OpenStack environment and um, go to town trying it all out. Okay, so this project goal. So I was uh, contacted uh, through Packet. They were asked to, um, uh, Packet is a bare metal hosting provider, uh, to figure out if OpenStack can run on these ARM-based servers that they're getting in and making available um, through their service. So we wanted to know is the default open store uh, open source, upstream, OpenStack, uh, can you run it on ARM? If you just take the code 100% open source before any vendor gets a hold of it and run it on top of ARM-based uh, systems, 
its own, whether or not there are any showstoppers that prevent it from working. Um, we want to take a look across all the various OpenStack services from networking to compute to identity management. Uh, next, we want to take a look at does it make sense from a financial point of view to use ARM-based processors to run your cloud? Do you get the price to performance um, metric that's, uh, you know, does it make sense from a financial perspective? Are you getting adequate performance? And um, from a cost perspective, does it make sense? Uh, and then we want to take a look at if whether or not we can mix traditional x86, AMD64 systems and ARM-based systems in the same cloud environment, and will the system run correctly? Is it smart enough to know what things should be run on the ARM system, what should be run on the AMD system, um, and uh, see how well that works. And then most of all, make it all available online so you can clone it, you can run it, you can spin up your own cloud environment, so that's what we made available. And then also the patches that were required, contribute them back into the open source community so that um, those fixes are, are made available to others. Okay, so real quick, for those of you that aren't familiar with ARM, what, what's it all about? It's a brand new processor architecture. Well, not really brand new. It's been around for a long time in the mobile phone and um, mobile devices and consumer devices. That's where I originally started out as a low, processor, low power uh, processor um, and then since then, it's migrated, it's, it's grown, and now we see it in a lot of next generation servers, uh, you know, rack mountable um, servers used for, you know, commodity um, business applications. And the idea is that since it's a lower power consumption, it's lower cost, uh, you have a lower cost of ownership of installing it in a data center, lower power means low, less heat's generated, which means you can have higher density, so, you know, space is a consideration of data center. And then uh, lower power means less heat, which means less air conditioning. So maybe you can run it at, uh, you know, your air conditionings don't have to run uh, as hard, or you, maybe you can even get away without having to have air conditioning if you use these processors. Um, when you take a look at an ARM processor, you'll find out they have more cores than their traditional AMD or x86 processor, uh, and they scale up by introducing more cores within the chip as opposed to you know, the AMD 64 chips of the world, where they scale up by going faster and faster and faster. And um, there are a bunch of different vendors of ARM processors. Uh, when we get through this a little bit later, we'll see a couple of them. Okay, so Cloudflare, I'm sure most people have heard of Cloudflare. They're a CDN, a content distribution network that sits in front of web servers. They run a worldwide network, and they're used to accelerate uh, websites by caching content across the internet. Uh, and also provide uh, DDoS mitigation. So they have a huge network of um, their own, you know, custom software, their own uh, systems that they run across data centers around the world. Um, their CEO, he tweeted here that he is seeing, he's excited about these new ARM-based systems. He's seeing um, better performance, better price to performance. And he's actually saying it makes more sense for him to go spend the upfront capital cost of buying the ARM processors, getting them installed, because he's seeing a faster payoff than sticking with his existing um, processors. So, um, so it's interesting to see that such a big CDN provider that's running such a large cloud environment, um, whether or not we can see the same sort of benefits on an OpenStack open source environment. So, um, so we used a bare metal hosting provider. They were kind enough to provide all of the equipment for this, um, for us to run the testing. So packet hosts, those who are familiar, they're a bare metal service provider, but they're slightly different in that they have an API that we can hit. We hit the API to provision the hardware, um, and literally within five, six, seven minutes, you get a brand new physical machine, 100% dedicated to you. Um, they have a bunch of different types and a bunch of different ARM systems and AMD64, and you're basically built by the hour for it. So the benefit for this is we could automate the whole thing we could automate the provisioning of the hardware and then the installation of the operating system and everything else above it, all the networking, so we can get reproducible cloud environments consisting of multiple physical servers that we could provision, build the cloud, run the tests, and deprovision, de and we can do it in a highly replicated manner time and time again. Uh, their API, it's a REST interface. Um, you can hit it with a bunch of different tools. In here, you'll see how we use Terraform. Uh, to hit their APIs to, to provision the hardware. 
Um, okay, so here's a breakdown of all of the different um, physical machines that we use that are provided from a uh, packet. It's a combination of AMD64 and ARM systems. So the first three are three different AMD64 systems, and the last three are the three different uh, ARM64 systems that we use in this. Um, the TDP, that's the uh, thermal displacement, so basically the amount of heat that's generated uh, for those processors, the number of cores. You take a look, you can see that the ARM systems, right, we got 96 cores, 64 cores, 40 cores. Uh, so um, they're really good at running multiple parallel systems, multiple parallel processes at the same time because they have the additional cores. But then if you take a look at the speed, they, you know, they do run uh, slightly slower than um, the uh, than the equivalent AMD systems, basically, you're gaining the advantage from having additional cores. Um, in terms of the disk drive on this, all of the systems have SSD drives, so pretty similar there. Uh, pretty similar on the um, on the RAM, when, when you take a look at the larger ones. RAM never really came into consideration of any of the testing that we're using here. And then the networking, um, I, all of them had dual uh, gigabits at a minimum interfaces connected on uh, the real systems that we're using had uh, dual 10 gigabit networks connected onto them. Okay, so how do we go about uh, building the cloud? This is just really high level. The instructions on the GitHub have uh, much more detailed instructions if you want to uh, take a look at how it's done. But at a real high level, basically you clone the repo that's got all the Terraform configuration files in it. You edit the uh, vars.tf, the Terraform configuration file, which basically details out the number of each uh, bare metal uh, physical server that you want, and then the, the function of it, basically the OpenStack function, whether it's a compute node or it's a controller node. Um, you need to install Terraform on your system if you don't have it already. already. Uh, Terraform in it will pull in all of the needed plugins, which are the uh, providers, the glue code between Terraform and whatever uh, provider using, in our case, Packet. Uh, you do need to pull in the API tokens from Packet, very similar to an AWS token uh, to validate the provide credentials into it. You need to set up some SSH, generate some SSH keys, which are then distributed out to the machines so you can log in. And then you execute Terraform, about 10, 15 minutes, um, the cloud will be built, depending on you know, the number of machines you have, three, four, five. Um, since everything is done in parallel, it always takes about the same amount of time. And then finally, Terraform will give you the credentials and the URL and the SSH command to log into the cloud environment. Okay, so a little bit more about the uh, Terraform installer that we're running. Um, so like we said, you can go through, configure it out to be an arbitrary number of uh, uh, AMD and uh, ARM servers. Uh, we only use the packet systems, so all the provisioning was, was through, uh, through Terraform directly to the packet API. Um, and uh, you know, the installation is pretty quick. Uh, basically, Terraform is smart enough to realize what things can be done concurrently uh, and what things have to be done um, in, uh, in serial, uh, what dependencies exist in the, in the building. Uh, the instructions that we use to build uh, this OpenStack environment, we got directly from the OpenStack.org's website. So we're installing the Pike version of OpenStack. So you can go directly there, follow those steps one, one by one. We basically took all of those manual steps, put them into Terraform. Um, most people that run OpenStack, you know, they like to use a specific vendor. We wanted to stay as neutral as possible and use the true uh, you know, open source um, uh, code and uh, installation instructions. And then we had three different types of cloud nodes, um, a controller node, a compute node, and a dashboard node. Uh, the dashboard node is purely a uh, web uh, GUI used by humans. Uh, it's, it wasn't part of any of the testing we did. We just verified that it started up okay. Um, all of the testing used the APIs within the cloud environment uh, to provision VMs and to provision users. So um, the dashboard is just there to, to stay on top and so a human could monitor what's going on. Uh, for those who aren't familiar, controller nodes are the uh, brains of the cloud. They're the ones that keep track of what the what VMs are running, how the network configuration is set up, keeps track of all the identities within that's within Keystone. And the compute node, that's the muscle, that's where the VMs run, that has the hypervisor running. So um, 
in our environment, we ran AMD and ARM compute nodes so that we could run AMD and ARM uh, virtual machines. Okay, a little bit more about the, uh, the bare metal provider that we're running. So on the right here, you can see it's a screenshot of the uh, packets API website. So you can see, for example, there you can get a list of all the devices by you know just curling or, or hitting that API. On the left there is the Terraform VARS configuration file where you go through, you can see an example, um, the packet facility, you list which data center you wanna run this in. Uh, packet has multiple data centers across the world. Uh, for this testing, we always use the New Jersey, uh, the EWR1 facility. And then this is just a snippet, but you can see the packet controller type. Uh, the default that it's set up right now is bare metal 2A. So that is one of the ARM systems. So by changing that uh, value from bare metal 2A to bare metal 2A5, you can select a different um, uh, physical machine to use in the test. So that defines what gets built up in the cloud. Um, and then real quick, the environmental variables, the tokens and everything else, those are set up as environmental variables as opposed to being put into um, uh, the code files. So the infrastructure code files, that's just best practice so that your uh, tokens and your auth tokens don't get uh, sucked into version control and made available to the world. Uh, going through the configuration file, here we'll see some additional controller types. We'll see the dashboard type, uh, the type of compute nodes. Um, all of those, once again, are configurable. In a little bit later, we'll take a look at the different types of clouds that we built and the different con configurations. But if you want to go through and change the different settings, this is where you go through and you, and you pick what type of bare metal uh, you want um, inside your cloud environment. Okay. So in total, we ran um, clouds that were all the same bare metal type. For example, they were all the exact same ARM hardware from the same vendor, or they were all exactly the same AMD systems. Uh, the T0, T1, and C2, those are all ARM systems. The T2A2, T2A5, and the T2A, those are all ARM-based systems. So we had some clouds that were 100% all identical bare metal types. And then we built some clouds that were mixes of different of AMD and ARM just to see how well that worked out as well. So in total, we built seven different clouds. Each cloud consisted of from three to five uh, physical machines um, underneath. So uh, to keep track of that, we tagged all of the physical hosts with a cloud ID so we knew which physical host um, was part of which cloud environment. So when you take a look, uh, this in the lower left-hand corner here, this is an output of the packet API, and you can see these tag ID that there tells you which cloud environment um, each of the machines belong to. Uh, for example, because dashboard doesn't really tell you which cloud it belongs to, but if you take a look at the tag, you, you know which cloud it belongs to. And all of this that is done within Terraform. And Terraform allows you to just create a, a random ID for each cloud, the four bytes long, and then we tag that within um, packet as part of their API call. You can pass along some tags, some metadata about each machine. So we tag them all with uh, the cloud ID. So just made it a little bit easier to keep track of all the hardware. Okay. Um, so to keep things consistent, we ran all of these tests in the same data center. So the EWR1, the New Jersey data center. Um, to make sure we weren't dependent on any external sources uh, or interference, we used DNS configuration files, so Etsy hosts. Uh, we had Terraform build those hosts files and then distribute them out across all the machines. Um, and uh, we used a backend private network to do all the communications between the machines. Um, Packet, when they set you up with a machine, they each machine has a bonded interface but then there are virtual interfaces for private networking or for uh, public networking. And then on top of the cloud, we um, set it up with a number of different virtual machine images. These images were then used to instantiate running instances. And it's a combination of uh, CentOS, Cirrus, uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, ARM, and uh, x86 AMD64 um, VM images. So these images, we started up to verify functionality and that virtual machine images could run correctly on top of the cloud. Okay, 
So like I said, we've, we've run through most of this already, talked about it, but uh, we set up the type and number, and then we distributed the SSH keys. So the SSH keys are basically used for if a human being wants to log into the system and take a look at what's going on. Uh, so we start up Terraform. This is just a breakdown of, it sort of shows you the flow of how Terraform goes and runs and builds, builds the cloud. So time goes from the top of this slide down to the bottom. Um, first things that happen is uh, the bare metal physical provisioning of the hardware. Um, in this instance, uh, these were some of the AMD 64 machines. So about seven minutes, about six, six minutes, 50 seconds, it took to provision four physical servers. And like I said, this happens all in parallel. All four physical machines spin up at the same time. Uh, they get assigned IP addresses. The operating system gets assigned. This is basically all on packet. We basically make an API call, and then we res get a response back from the API that, that it's done. Uh, the other part is gathering all the IP addresses, saving those into a host file, and then Terraform uh, copies that host file out. So at the end of seven minutes, we've got the physical hardware. It's up and running and ready to go. Um, from there, we get started on the OpenStack installation. So in this case, we have a controller node, which is uh, the brains of it all. We have a dashboard, a GUI interface, each of those on a separate uh, physical machine. And then we have a number of basically identical, identical compute nodes. Uh, Terraform runs all four of those uh, concurrently. So at the same time, OpenStack is getting installed, the various components or uh, software is being pulled down and installed. Um, in this case, uh, four and a half minutes it took to get the controller built out and then just under two minutes to get all the dashboard and the compute nodes up and running. Uh, and once the controller node is built, it, then it goes and pulls down all those VM images and then over, uh, also some additional software, a Nova console, that's to get access to the console port for the ARM system. Um, then once all of that is done, about five and a half minutes, um, then Terraform gets started actually starting up the VMs and all of the uh, software networking, uh, software-defined networking on top of the cloud. So Terraform has hooks into OpenStack and can call the, all those APIs and provision all the virtual machines. And it's smart enough to know that the controller needs to be up, that all the images need to be up, all that, all those dependencies are built into the Terraform configuration file. So it knows which dependencies need to be completed before it goes on. Uh, here's a sample output. When Terraform finishes, you can see it gives you a list of all the IP addresses of the um, compute servers that started up. It gives you the URL to log into the dashboard with the username and password, and then gives you the SSH command to SSH into, uh, into the nodes, into the controller nodes uh, to run uh, command lines there. So, and then you can run Terraform output to re-get this information. If there are multiple compute nodes, if there are multiple uh, ARM systems or multiple compute x86 systems, it'll list out all of the IP addresses. In this case, we just had one ARM compute node and one uh, x86 compute node. Okay, so that said, what changes did we have to make to the installer to get this to work? Um, the stock installer, the instructions available are for obviously x86 systems. So what did we have to do to get the ARM to, to modify it to get to work on ARM? Uh, first thing we found out is that there are some hard-coded sections where it pulls in um, basically packages that are available for ARM, but, um, but the installer, the commands are written to pull down the x86, the AMD64 binaries. So we had added some code where we basically go through to detect what processor we're running on, whether we're running an ARM or x86, and then pull down the, um, the correct uh, ARM64 um, packages. So we saw this in etcd. Uh, one interesting thing about etcd is ARM64 is, the, is an unsupported experimental architecture. So in the, X, in the etcd configuration, you do have to go through and set a flag that you acknowledge that you're running um, unsupported or a, a experimental uh, version of the software. So, um, this, uh, the AMD systems require some additional firmware. Uh, so we those um, and then additional uh, parameters for the uh, hypervisor. So we go through and we enable those. So here you can see them, uh, the one, two, three, uh, basically the libverts uh, setting up 
KVM and enabling host pass-through mode. Uh, ARM64 virtual machines don't have a serial console support. They require uh, an alternate way of connecting in that Nova console uh, command. So we have to install that Nova console software, and then we have to disable VNC on those compute servers so, so it doesn't run instead, the connections are made through Nova console. So a couple of extra software and uh, configuration. Um, and then last but not least, uh, stuff, obviously we have to install the um, ARM64 VMs, or sorry, uh, images. So we download those from the internet. Uh, they're available, CentOS, uh, Seven, Cirrus, uh, Ubuntu, Fedora, most of the major distributions all have are, are all building ARM64 virtual machine images, so, so they're they're out there and available. So this this is just the uh, walkthrough of the OpenStack commands required to uh, create a, a virtual machine image that's used to start up instances. Uh, you do have to define the the hardware firmware type so that you knows to use the extra uh, firmware to start it up start up the VM. Okay. So those are the patches that we had to make. So now we go into the functional testing and find out, well, does this really work? So we wanna know, uh, you know, do individual x86 and ARM64 uh, VMs start up? Uh, do all of the various OpenStack services run on top of ARM64? Basically, can we run the controller and dashboard nodes on ARM64 systems? <laughs> and then can we talk across between x86 and ARM64 VMs running on different compute nodes? So. Uh, this is an output of uh, just a standard OpenStack command just to show all of the services running. And here we can see the Nova Compute. So that's the um, responsible for running all the virtual machines and hypervisors. So we can see it's running on an x86 and an ARM system. So we know we can run the services correctly and we're able to run them, uh, run all these services, ARM services ran just, just as well as the x86 services uh, for all of the OpenStack services that we tested. Um, let's take a look at what the hypervisor shows us. So we're running, we're taking a look at the ARM64 systems that's running and that has 96 physical cores. And we can see it outputs that yes, it is successfully seeing all 96 uh, uh, cores across. So that was um, success there. Uh, can we run a mix of x86 and ARM64 virtual machines? So obviously the ARM64 virtual machines would run on an ARM compute node, different physical server, and the x86 would run on a uh, AMD64 uh, physical server. So we got, in this case, uh, two virtual machines running on each of two different physical nodes for four virtual machines total, and we, they communicate just fine across, uh, across the physical network and across the virtual networking to each other. So no problems there. So performance testing. So now we know from a functional standpoint, everything works. So uh, we use a tool called Rally. It's a common OpenStack tool. Uh, comes with a bunch of stock um, tests that you can run. And it basically hits the APIs within OpenStack to do a bunch of different uh, tests. In this case, we ran an account management task to add and delete users within the OpenStack uh, cloud. It hits key the Keystone API. Um, and, then, and we also did uh, a more typical starting up and shutting down virtual machines. So all of these tests, we ran 10 concurrent tests at once, repeated a um, thousand times. We wanted to see zero errors and it must pass Rally's defined service level. Uh, so Rally defines, you know, like three seconds, how, how quickly it should take to run the various tests. tests. Okay, and we, we took a look at the 95th percentile as a typical output. So uh, Rally input is uh, put in as a JSON file. So here you see it, oops. You see an, uh, an example of um, a test. Um, and uh, we go through Run Rally. The output, you can convert it into HTML. So here you see a sample output. It gives us a minimum time, medium time, 90th, 95th percentile. And it tells us whether it passed the SLA and it uh, tells us whether or not there are any uh, failures. So. so that said, here are all the um, different cloud types that we started across and we, we ran things across. Um, so the account management, that's that keystone task of adding and deleting users. So our small little T0 machine here, 
uh, that packet rents out for seven cents an hour. Um, it took 6.1 seconds to go through and run the test. And then going down the line, we can see that uh, uh, those, uh, we go up to the beefier AMD 64 machines, we get the 5.1 and two seconds. And then we take a look at the ARM systems. We have three seconds, 2.5 seconds, 2.5 seconds. So it's getting, you know, up to the same speed as the AMD systems. Um, then we take a look at the VM management, which is spinning up virtual machines. The two smallest AMD systems did not have enough processing power to run this test without basically being overwhelmed, uh, having API failures because basically there are too many tasks and um, meeting the uh, minimum service level. So, so that in that case, it's not not enough CPUs. So uh, we had to mark the, those systems down as not as failing. Uh, however, the um, even the smallest uh, ARM system it was able to successfully pass the uh, service level and give zero um, failure rates, basically because it has more cores, it can parallelize it all and keep everything running all at once. So we take a look at the speed. Obviously, for the smallest one, we had 80 seconds, uh, pretty slow, but then we definitely sped up on the, the two more recent uh, ARM systems. Um, the other thing to take a look at when you take a look, when you want to compare these, is the power consumption the uh, thermal displacement versus the um, uh, the time to get things done. So in this case, we're taking a look at the AMD system with 155 watts versus this uh, Qualcomm at 110 watts. So a considerably less power, which is going to equate to, you know, it costing less to run, um, using less uh, air conditioning, and everything else like that. Okay, so uh, to wrap up here, you know, let's take a look at the goals. So the result is OpenStack ready for ARM? Well, yeah, we were able to run everything. From a functional standpoint, everything worked. We didn't run into any showstoppers. Uh, we just you know, found a couple of tweaks that we had to do to the installer. Um, does it make sense to run ARM on OpenStack, to run OpenStack on ARM? Um, yep, we found it definitely makes sense. You know, you get some improvement on parallelism. All the services run. You can get some cost savings on it. And uh, can we mix the two environments together? Yep, we can definitely mix the two environments together, which brings some interesting uh, perspective when you think about, hey, what what services might make sense to run ARM on and what uh, services might make sense to run the AMD services on? Okay, so that wraps up. I've, I don't know if we had any questions from Twitter or if people are thinking up their questions, I have a couple of questions of my own that I can answer. You, you come well prepared. Uh, we did have a few <laughs> questions I'm talking about. Oh, here's one. Ken Albone asks, how long does provisioning via Terraform usually take? I think you you showed that in your one of your slides, it was like about seven minutes for the nodes to come up, right? Yeah, so it, it obviously depends on the, uh, the I, I think we're talking about the physical machine provisioning. So the physical machine provisioning depends on the physical machine type because you are doing a full operating system install. So the systems I use, you know, I'll have SSD drives. You know, I think there's like half a terabyte of storage. Um, Packet does have some larger machines that take longer because they have more storage and it all needs to be formatted. But uh, the physical machines, typically about seven to eight minutes for the physical machines to come online. Um, and then in total, uh, I always plan about 15 minutes for the whole OpenStack cloud to come online. The full platform. Sounds good. And I was the one that tweeted you there, sorry. You mentioned <laughs> you had some questions. I, I would love to hear them. Okay. Okay, so so first question I've had is, so where do we go from here? Um, you know, what are the other things to look at? So I would like to do some more performance testing. Rather than taking a look at the time it takes to get a process done, instead of how long does it take to spin up a VM, how long does it take to add a user, I want to find out how many concurrent requests the cloud environment can, can handle before uh, performance gets degraded. Um, you know, if, if these ARM systems have got 96 cores versus the AMD systems with 24 cores, does that mean we can run three times as many API requests 
and be spinning up three times as many VMs before we're going to see, you know, a decline in performance. Um, so that's the, the first performance testing I'd like to see done. And the other thing is, is edge computing. So we've got these ARM systems, they're using less power. Does, does this mean we could take the compute nodes and move them into satellite offices, maybe even move them out of the data center into satellite offices, you know, an office, five, 10 people in it, and put compute nodes there with the core of the cloud back in the data center, but maybe these ARM compute nodes in a satellite office where maybe there isn't air conditioning, but it's okay because uh, these, these systems aren't generating a lot of power. So to r run some testing, find out if that's a workable scenario, um, if, if there are latency concerns, uh, or if a cloud can really run like that. Any more I, questions? I actually oh, have okay. a, long, uh, okay. a, a long and tricky question. This is your, your hard oh, no. question for tonight. Did you run across any issues with Neutron networking on ARM? I suspect that this might become a factor when you want to do things like SRIOV and DPVK, which is already a little tricky on the x86. Just curious if you have plans for looking at VMs with high throughput networking on ARM. Okay, so, um, so the second part there, the question on throughput of the network, there wasn't any testing of throughput through the ARM system or network throughput. Uh, so I mean, that's definitely something that could be tested out. In terms of problems with uh, Neutron, um, didn't have to jump through any extra hoops to get um, Neutron working on these systems. It was pretty, you know, stock as ever, um, or as well, I guess you can say, as, as simple or as difficult as ever to, to set up Neutron. Um, but uh, yeah, I didn't see any differences there between between regular um, x86. Yeah, probably DPVK, DPVK might be one of those things that you have to enable and, and really test, right? Uh, we have another question. Where did okay. you get the prices for computes? Was that from packet.com? Yes, so um, you can go to packet, packet.net, and you can log in and you can type in your credit card number, and those are the pricing that they charge to run these uh, these machines. So it's all inclusive of, uh, it's per hour, so it's all inclusive of, you know, the hardware and the, um, you know, all the operational costs, right? The the air conditioning and everything, so. So those costs were directly from the from the website. Sounds good. I, and I found a web page with packet host pricing and I sent it over. So okay. that helps. I gotta say this was very informative for me. Um, it opens up my mind on wow, right? I, I knew that ARM was already out chipping Intel um, on terms of quantity of processors, but it never occurred to me that it was a better server workload uh, processor. So this is pretty cool that it wasn't too difficult to get it working, and that you can actually we can actually start start benchmarking and and looking at switching, right? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, I mean, that was the other part of is what's the best way to introduce ARM into your network? And so one of the things is is maybe you take, take ARM and you use it to replace the your cloud controllers because all the OpenStack services run on um, on top of the ARM system and your enterprise workloads that maybe you haven't recompiled yet for ARM, you keep the compute nodes as AMD64. Um, so you can use that as a way to, to migrate on. So like your file servers, move them on to ARM um, while you, uh, while those enterprise applications that haven't been recompiled yet continue to run on the x86s. Very Another cool. way to bring it all together. Hmm. I, I saw that you had, you were not expecting questions. <laughs> oh yeah, I always like to have a couple in my back pocket there. <laughs> Still no questions. Well. I really liked it. Is that is that your final slide? Um, I believe so. Oh yes. And then obviously, can I run this oh, on a Raspberry Pi? I thought about this. <laughs> I thought about this. I'm like, nice. Yeah, you can run this on a bunch of Raspberry Pis, right? <laughs> I believe people have. Yes, believe it or not. Um, I have not. I run it on Intel Next. Those are x86s, though. So. 
But uh, yes, there are people out there that run OpenStack clouds on ARM, on Raspberry Pis. Very, very cool. I mean, we actually got a pretty good turnout. We we got around twenty people on the uh, on the webcast. So I've I've taken some screenshots of your of your presentation and put them on on Twitter. So I'm hoping that you're going to get some direct questions. Um, but I don't see any more questions flowing in. Do you want to close it up? Um, if you are really in love with this, you can definitely go to the GitHub page. Just today, someone pinged me. They were spinning up a cloud to use. You know, they wanted to do CI CD. So if you want to try it out, let me know. Um, you can even send me a message. I have a $25 code. I don't know what it is off the top of my mind. That gets you $25 worth of free um, computing power at Packet. So you can send me a note, and I can send you that code. Um, and uh, and then I will be presenting the same presentation at the OpenStack Summit in Vancouver uh, later this month. So you're welcome to meet me up in Vancouver as well. Sounds awesome. Well, John, I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And this will yeah, be the end. You. I will stop the recording.